All right, so we're going to do another example with Lagrange multipliers. We're going to work this one from beginning to end. Um, over here, I've, I've thrown up some of the scenarios where you might find yourself using Lagrange multipliers. Um, and, um, you know, things, you know, the, there's a lot of variety of this. There's a lot of different situations where you could do it. We're going to stick primarily to the, the simplest case where you've got a function of two variables. You've got a single constraint. Um, you don't, you can't have more than one constraint really if you have, uh, if you've only got two variables because if you have, if you have two constraints, that's two level curves, right? Meaning you're only considering points that lie on both curves. That pretty much restricts you to just looking at the points of intersection of those two curves and that generally is a finite number of points, right? Uh, and then it's just plugging in values, right? So you don't want to over constrain things or there's no calculus left to do. You're just solving for the points that you can plug in. Um, right? So a single constraint is really the only thing that makes sense. Um, you have this Lagrange multiplier equation, right? The gradient of f must be a multiple of the gradient of g. Uh, and now, those gradients have two components in them. So this only gives you a pair of equations. It, uh, you know, one for each component. But there are three variables, x, y, and lambda. So you do need a third equation if you want to solve, um, you know, if you want to have a finite number of solutions. The third equation comes from the constraint itself. Uh, now you have three equations, three unknowns, so at least in principle you can solve. Um, by the way, one of the troubles with finding, you know, good Lagrange multiplier problems is that the equations can get really ugly in a hurry. Um, another example, uh, same thing but with three variables, right? The only thing that changes is now there's a z-coordinate and a corresponding z-component for the gradient vector. So now it's four equations, four unknowns, right? The three variables plus the multiplier. And again, you can solve. Um, with three variables, you can actually consider two constraints, right? Because a constraint in three variables is a surface. Um, and if you intersect two surfaces, they're probably gonna intersect along some sort of curve, right? So, so you, have one, you have one surface, let's say, and then you intersect with another surface and, uh, you know, and chances are they're going to meet along some kind of curve. And the idea here is that curve of intersection for the two surfaces, right? Um, again, if you imagine kind of moving along that curve, the tangent vector there is tangent to both surfaces. So it's perpendicular to both normal vectors, right? Um, and, and so again, you can kind of play around and, and you do a little bit of li linear algebra and you realize that the, the condition here for optimizing is going to be that the the gradient for f, well, it should be a linear combination of the gradients for the, the two normal vectors, for gradient of g and gradient of h, right? Um, and, and you can generalize this, right? Um, so you can, you can keep going up more variables, more constraints. You can get pretty complicated with this, but we'll start simple. Um, two variables, one constraint. Now. Let me draw the problem out for you. I think it's important to sort of see what's going on visually when you're doing Lagrange multipliers before you dive into the algebra, because the algebra can get ugly. Here's my coordinate plane. Let me draw my constraint curve. My constraint is an ellipse, all right? And it's an ellipse which looks something like that. Okay, so there's my, my constraint curve. Now, the level curves for my function, right, if I, if I set f of xy equal to a constant, right, if I take f of xy and I set that equal to c, well, that's pretty much the same thing as, you know, I can move the y over and say y is going to be 2x plus 1 minus c, right? Well, I know what that is. That's a, uh, that's a line with slope 2 in a particular intercept. I know how to draw a line with slope 2 in a particular intercept. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get lines that look like something like this, right? All right. There's the level curves for my, for my function f, right? And the bigger c gets, the further down our intercept is going to be, right? So, 
So these are kind of ordered in increasing C, right? This is small C, that's big C. And so we keep making C bigger and bigger, right? If I make C too big, my line doesn't intersect the, the constraint curve, and now I don't have any solutions, right? There will not be any points that satisfy this equation that give me that particular value of C, whatever this C value is. So I can't use that. So we ask, what's the biggest value of C we can have where we still satisfy the constraint? And that's going to be the one that only just touches our constraint curve, right? So that's going to be the max. And the min is going to be the smallest value of C that just touches, right? There's our, our minimum, okay? And now, of course, the, um, the gradient of f, right, well, it's the same everywhere. f is a linear function, right? So the gradient is just going to be the normal vector for the common normal vector for all of these lines. It's just the vector 2 minus 1, right? So it's, it's the vector pointing out like this, gradient of f, okay? So there's a few ways to think about how you solve this. You're looking for the points where the gradient of f is basically perpendicular to, to the constraint curve, to the ellipse, right? We want this line here to be a tangent line for the ellipse. Now, you could do this with sort of calc 1 methods. If you wanted to, you could say, look, this is a line that has slope 2, so I'm looking for the points on the ellipse where, where my tangent line has slope 2. I can use implicit differentiation to get dy dx from here, right? And I can figure out the values of x and y that give me a slope of 2. That's going to give me my points on the ellipse. But we want to practice using Lagrange multipliers, so let's set up the equations, right? So I want this to be equal to lambda times the gradient of g, which is 4x and 2y. Okay, so this gives me a pair of equations, right? So this is, this is the gradient of g, where g is, is this function here, okay? So I need 4 times x times lambda should be 2, and 2 times y times lambda should be equal to minus 1. All right. And now you've got to think about how do you actually solve these equations, right? Um, you've got one, two, three variables, two equations. You do have one more equation in your back pocket, which is the, uh, the constraint equation that you started with. Okay? Um, so there, there are some different things you could do. You could, you could play around with maybe you say, okay, what if lambda is zero, right? Well, if lambda is equal to zero, well, that can't actually happen, right? I know that lambda can't be zero. Okay, why can't it be zero? It can't be zero because then I'd have, I'd have this vector, which is clearly not zero, equal to the zero vector. So lambda is not zero. Um, so I could do things like this. I could say that uh, x is 2 over 4 lambda, so 1 over 2 lambda. I could say that y is, is minus 1 over 2 lambda, okay? And I can plug those in. So where do I plug them in? I can plug them into this constraint equation, okay? So x squared, so 2x squared plus y squared is going to be uh, 2 over 4 lambda squared plus 1 over 4 lambda squared, um, which is 3 over 4 lambda squared. That needs to be equal to 1, okay? Well, that means that 4 lambda squared needs to equal 3. So lambda, lambda has to be plus or minus root 3 over 2. Okay? 
And now with those values, I can come back and I can, I can figure out what X and Y have to be, right? So we get two points. First point is going to be um, X is equal to, so it's one over two lambda. Uh, so two lambda, why not? Two lambda is just plus or minus root three, right? Because I've got two lambda here. So X will be plus or minus one over root three. Um, well, okay, in the, I guess if we're doing, yeah, you know, let's just ignore that. X can be plus or minus one over root three. Y will be sort of, it's the opposite sign, right? So Y is minus plus one over root three, right? So I get two points. I get either one over root three minus one over root three, or I get minus one over root three and one over root three, all right? Now we know from the picture that the first of those two points must be the maximum because it's, uh, it's down here in quadrant three. The second of those two points must be the minimum up here in, or that's quadrant <coughs> four rather. The min must be this one up here in quadrant two, yeah? Okay. Uh, if we want to confirm, we can plug them back into our function, right? Um, f at 1 over root 3 minus 1 over root 3. What's that going to be? It's going to be um, 2 over root 3 minus minus 1 over root 3. So 3 um, over root 3, which is, if I simplify, root 3 plus 1. That's going to be the max. And this one, now I have minus 2 over root 3 minus 1 more. So minus 3 over root 3, which is just minus root 3, minus root 3 plus 1. And that's the min. Okay? So that's how you solve that one using Lagrange multipliers. Um, now, my, uh, my choice of algebraic steps here are probably not the only option. There's, there's a number of ways that you might try to tackle these, um, but it's, it's one possibility, okay? Um, the, unfortunately, unlike linear algebra, there is no kind of algorithm. There's no series of steps that, that you're going to be able to follow um, to, to solve these things. There's a certain amount of, of kind of trial and error and creativity that you have to rely on to figure out how to solve these sorts of equations. Okay, we'll do, uh, we'll do another example in the next video.